Welcome back to the Investing with Purpose podcast, where we explore the intersection of success and significance. We discuss alternative investment options from our experience buying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate, but most importantly, how we're using that business to impact people in a positive way to leave a legacy that matters. Let's get after it. So today we're going to talk about effective communication, and this is kind of an amalgamation of all of the things that I've learned over years from exceptional communicators. So books to read, I know I've talked about this before, but uh, Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference is not a negotiation book. It is a communication book. And to effectively communicate to have a basic understanding of his terminology and how to utilize those things. Um, at first, it's, it feels a little bit like what they call the spotlight effect, where you're trying some new different tactic and you feel almost like people are going to know what you're doing or why you're doing it or why, um, like, is it incendiary? Is that a word? Um or not honest because you're using a tactic to try to bring out communication. And I would argue that after some time, you'll realize that it is the best way to communicate and listen to understand versus listen to respond. So never split the difference. Great book. The like switch is another great book on uh, communication. And um, I had another one. It'll come to me in a minute, but so let's talk about listening to, understand versus listening to respond first. And, you know, I'll put this in kind of donors terms because I think fundraising is the most sales centric thing that nonprofits have to do. Um, and there's a couple of really good ways to do that. And the best way is asking good questions, right? There's a great book by John Maxwell called uh, Great Leaders Ask Great Questions. And what it does is it opens up the dialogue to really understanding your counterpart. Counterpart would be donor, sales, perspective, client, et cetera. And when you can understand your counterpart, it really helps shape the conversation to what they want to hear. Who knows that not everybody wants to hear what you say the way you say it. So sales is really just a kind of an understanding. Communication is really just an understanding of how to present the same information in different ways for those people so that they receive it the best way. And for me, I know that I can get super excited and want to tell my story. And essentially, you need to understand that that's how everybody is. Everybody wants to tell their story in their way so that they can be um, understood. Who knows that the favorite word that anybody can hear is their own name. So that's why some tactical sales books tell you to use that person's name throughout a presentation a few times. Don't overuse it. It'll feel weird, but try to use it. Um, try to remember people's names and then I'm historically terrible at this, but <laughs> if you try to create some, um, you know, word puzzles or whatever you call them to remember somebody else's name, it's, uh, it's super helpful. So listening to understand versus listening to respond, often we get caught up in how we're going to respond to something. So we hear somebody for a couple of seconds and then we already have the right next thing that we're going to say. And, um, You've all been in those conversations where you know that that's not landing with the person because they're just waiting for you to stop talking so that they can jump in. So tactical listening, right? Listening to understand is probably step one of the best communication advice that I've ever heard. And it seems really simple, right? Of course, we have to listen. But how many of us actually are taking the time to listen without judgment? So listening without judgment, we learned from a Navy SEAL operator that I got to spend some time with. And what does he mean by that? Listening without judgment is not agreeance. I think in today's society, it means that we have to agree with somebody because we're not judging it. But that's not really what it means. What it means is how are we listening with no response, with no advice to, to give at the end of just listen. Right? Just take it in, just absorb, just be empathetic. Um, and I think a lot of people think that empathy relates to agreeance, but that's not the case. It's really just listening to understand how that person's feeling with no judgment. That is a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, we did a training with our team about listening without judgment and very few people ever make it past step one of listening without judgment. Sit with your spouse and just try to understand what they're saying without responding because response is not understanding. Responding is judgment. So think, think that through and see if you can start to practice some of those listening without judgment tactics, like just let somebody listen. You don't have to jump in right away or have an opinion or, you know, respond, right? You can just listen and be empathetic about it. And I think it's really important um, because we historically are pretty terrible <laughs> at doing that. Um, the next thing is... How do we um, how do we show tactical empathy, right? So, what is tactical empathy? I'm looking up Chris's uh, verbiage right now <clears throat> because tactical empathy is the next kind of phase, right? And so, simply put, Chris Voss says that the act of understanding another person's mindset and feelings and making them feel understood. So, you know, when you um, when you talk to somebody and you know you can give them an idea of why you're listening, they usually will see you shut off to a point where you're saying something that is in response to what you think or how you feel, right? Um, I'm on the Black Swan group, so blackswanltd.com is, um, is Chris Voss's book and they have a lot of free resources on um, on all of their different tactics, right? So uh, I'm looking up 10 negotiation skills, Black Swan Group. Bear with me, sorry guys. So um, we were on tactical empathy and what that means for active listening. So active listening, tactical empathy, those two things go hand in hand. When you're talking about uh, tactically empathizing with somebody, it just means that you're listening without judgment, right? When you're actively listening, you're not thinking to respond, you're listening to understand. So um, I'm gonna go to Chris Voss's 10 most popular negotiation terms or communication terms and just run through them because I really do think that this book is amazing. I've listened to it seven or eight times now and the whole book is just how do we become better communicators. Um, all right, so number one, labels. A label is a verbal observation of the, emotional, of the emotion that you're seeing. So a label would be like when you're having a conversation, you can say it seems like, it sounds like, it feels like, depending on how they're seeing. It's like, so if they're telling you that they're not happy, you can literally just say it seems like you're not happy with that and then wait, right? And just let them kind of continue to speak. Now, why is this so important? A label or a mirror or something like that, you're just opening up conversation, you're getting that person to continue to speak. So a label is it seems like, it feels like, it you know, uh, sounds like, like it sounds like that made you angry. It sounds like that makes you really happy. It sounds like that's exciting, right? It seems like that's a, gonna be a great time for you and your family, whatever it is. And just try this in low um, risk situations, right? So like when you're sitting with a donor for the first time, probably isn't the time to start trying these tactics out. But when you go out to dinner, the waitress says, this is our special. And you can say, it seems like a lot of thought was put into that special. And she'll continue to go on. Oh yeah, the chef likes this or whatever, right? So it's just just try these little in uh, these little tactics in low risk situations. The next would be a mirror. A mirror is literally repeating the last three or four words that somebody just said to you. This will give you a spotlight effect, meaning that you'll think that people are going to recognize this immediately. But I guarantee you, nobody does. Um, when you get off this call, go into the kitchen or wherever your spouse or kids or counterpart is and just strike up a conversation. And when they give you an answer about something, hey, what are you going to make for dinner? You know, I was thinking we were going to have meatloaf and mashed potatoes, meatloaf and mashed potatoes, and then wait and watch. They will continue to talk about why meatloaf and mashed potatoes is on the menu tonight or, hey, I'm going to go take the car to get a car wash. And, oh, a car wash? Well, yeah, it's really dirty. The pollen is crazy, whatever, right? So. Again, really uh, interesting, very small tactical things that you can do to get people talking because effective communication isn't how you 
explain things. It's how well heard does that person feel so that they can get to you know, the, the point that they want to make, not what you want to make. And then you can tailor your conversation around what they're doing. You know, I had a conversation with a guy yesterday and he was telling me that he got a go to invest with us or he got a yes, but not a go. So we talk about this biblically in terms of does God give you a yes, but not now? Does he say yes, but not go? So this guy has a yes, but not a go. I said, I totally understand. Um, I'm not saying that there is, but if there was a hesitation, what would it be? He said, well, I'm not saying that this is a hesitation, which means it is. He said, but I think I'd feel more confident if I knew that you guys had exited more properties, right? You've sold more properties in your portfolio than the $150 million in sales that you have. I said, okay. He's like, not that that's a small number or anything. He's like, I think you guys are doing great. He's like, but it's just, you don't have a 20 year track record. I said, well, I would have had to get started really young to have that. But what I explained to him through asking and mirroring. So I said, uh, he literally said, if you had more exits and I said more exits. And then he went to explain that he meant more time in the business, more sales that produced the returns that we um, tell people we're going to return. And what it did was it just got me listening to what his concerns were. And it made me realize that I hadn't done a great job communicating with him that as fund managers, we partner with these operators that have vastly more experience than us with huge portfolios. And we're the funding arm of what they do as operators. The light bulb went on for him immediately. And he was like, wow, I'd love to see some of that data. So literally aggregating today and yesterday, the thousands of properties, thousands of units, hundreds and millions, maybe billions of dollars of sales that our partners have had because that's what he wanted to see. But I would have never got there if I didn't, if I just heard him say, I got a yes, but not a go. And I was like, okay, cool. Let me know when God tells you yes and go, right? I just wanted to understand more about why he was hesitating, right? Because when God says yes, but not go, that's probably an internal hesitation. Why is that? So I wanted to dig to the root of it. So we found it. And that's what effective communication is all about, right? So um, asking no oriented questions. This is an interesting one. If you ever get a phone call from me, I always ask you if it's a bad time. Not, is it a good time? So to say, is it a good time? People say yes, but they're hesitant. If you say, is it a bad time? People feel safe when they get to say no, right? Have you ever gotten a telemarketing call and it's like, hey, would you like to save money on your car insurance? The answer is yes. I do want to save money on my car insurance, but I'm already hesitant to listen to what they're going to say because I know I'm going to get pitched. So no oriented questions make people feel safe. So try to think about how you can orient a question to get a no response versus a yes, because mentally it makes them feel safe to communicate with you, right? So I always ask, is it a bad time? No, it's not a bad time. And it makes people go, no, why? Right? Is that too much? No, it's not too much. So think about what you're asking the person and how do you get a no oriented uh, question out of it, right? Because it gives us uh, the feeling of control, right? So they say Ronald Reagan uh, used to say this, are you better off than you were four years ago? No, right? He asked a series of no oriented questions in his last speeches and obviously won. So calibrated questions are what, how questions, sometimes why, but not so often. So if you think about when you ask questions, if you can orient a what or how, it's an open-ended question. It begs people to communicate more with you versus why. Have you ever got asked why? It immediately shuts you off a little bit. Um, why did you do that versus how am I supposed to do that? So very different in terms of engaging the right responses in terms of, are we trying to get shut somebody down or are we trying to get as much information from that communication that we can? Um, accusation audit. Basically it's throwing yourself under the bus, right? Eminem did this in eight mile. He <laughs> called out the other rappers and said, this is uh, exactly what you're going to say about me, right? He did an accusation audit and you can do this too. We had one experience where we were backing out of a deal with a uh, potential partner because they violated one of our core values of, of respect. They changed 
a management company while they were under contract and they didn't let us know and we found out after the fact and anyway we we jumped on a call and you know i think a little aside here is whenever you jump on the call you have to know what the reason for the call is and what the outcome is that what's the desired outcome of the call and i don't think we do this a lot i think we're like okay we're going to make a phone call and we're just going to see what happens uh, versus deciding for yourself what is a win what's a win in this situation for us getting out of the deal and not losing our deposit that we put up was the win right so do you want to be right or do you want to win is always a question that i ask and that's because often our ego wants us to be right so much that we'll feel righteous but we won't get to the win right there's great examples of this in chris voss's book about how people have blown this and how they've done it really well so we did it really well we went into the conversation and we said hey you know, I think you're gonna, we, we have some news that we wanna share with you and I think you're gonna think we're a bad partner. You think we're gonna, I think you're gonna feel like we uh, are abandoning you. And then we went into it, right? So we kind of did an accusation audit. Like this is how you're gonna feel. And then we went through. And the accusation audit is really just to prepare people, right? How, how do you see what's gonna go wrong? It's simply an approach where you're figuring out negative things that the other side might say and getting in front of it. And the accusation audit is um, a great way to making an ask or delivering bad news. So we had bad news to deliver, but before you make an ask, you can also say things like, hey, I think you're gonna think that I'm being presumptuous or um, that this is gonna be too big of an ask, but and I'm afraid to make it and then wait and let them go, no, 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 go ahead, right? And then you can make your ask. Um, and then summarizing it, so you're summarizing a synopsis of events and you're, you're bringing it back to people and saying, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is this, and when people say yes, you're not quite there, but when they say that's right, then you can, you have, if you think about the times where you hear, heard somebody say that's right, they're, they're emotionally engaged with you, they're seeing what you're seeing. Um, Dynamic silence, this is the hardest thing for me to teach my salespeople in the past because they hate silence. We're, we're programmed to fill the space instead of let silence sit. So again, low risk environments, try this with your spouse, kids, you know, whoever's in your life. And um, don't step on the silence is what I always tell my salespeople. Meaning when we ask somebody, it sounds like we've answered all your questions and it feels like you're ready to invest. Wait. In your head, you can literally count to seven Mississippi. You'll never get there. I've made it to four, maybe five with my wife when she knew I was doing it, but you literally won't get to seven because we have this need to fill the space, right? He who talks first loses is kind of the old sales adage. But the truth is, is that when you sit in, in the silence and you let people, first of all, I had to learn this with my wife because she processes things, not the way that I do. I, I'm very um, quick to respond and she needs a minute to process. So giving her that space to process and then actually respond makes her not feel attacked. So that's super helpful. Um, and then you can use obviously the tactical empathy is just understanding feelings and mindset that we already covered. So, so eight things that you can do to improve your communication skills. A leader's ability to communicate clearly and effectively with employees within teams and across organizations is one of the foundations of how to be successful. So how do we do it? Number one, be clear and concise. Communication is primarily about word choice. When it comes to word choice, less is more. One of the ways that you can actually tell when somebody is lying to you is when they're filling the space with too much information, right? That's one of the, in the like switch, I think the CIA, it was written by a CIA agent that was like a double cover agent or a spy or whatever. And he would always know and his counterpart was lying to him because they went into too much detail. They expanded too much on the information. So being clear and concise in your verbiage, having a less is more uh, attitude is really important. And for us, we have communication policies in place. So when you get internal, if you look in our, at our internal um, organization, we have everything is listed out in four distinct terms, priority, urgent, everything else, and delegate. And that helps us know when I get an email, where does this sit in my life, right? 
A priority is tied to company goals, quarterly rocks. Urgent means it needs to get done, but it doesn't trump a priority, right? It's just the next level down. Everything else is we'll get to it when we can. Doesn't mean it's not important. It just means it, it doesn't fall on that prioritization list. And then delegate is how do we um, how do we remove this from our plate and delegate it to somebody else? And in every email, every Voxer, every text message, well, we don't text unless it's personal. And that's another part of the communication policy is we use Voxer as a kind of a walkie talkie to communicate internally. Emails is really only when we're looping in somebody else. Phone calls are for priority information. Um, and then we have, is this action, response, information? So you'll see in the headers of our emails or Asana tasks, it'll say PR, Stephen this. And it'll be a priority response. I need to respond to that thing or priority action. You need to go do this and we can assign somebody a task. Everything else, uh, action, right? I need this done eventually, but it doesn't have to get done right now. So communication policies are important in terms of getting everybody in the same culture of communication because miscommunication is where frustration is born from. So if you can figure out a way to be clear and concise and have a communication policy in place that's helping you communicate internally with your team, super valuable, like really helpful. Um, prepare ahead of time. As a new salesperson, I wasn't really good at this. I just wanted to smile and dial, hammer the phones. Um, but preparing ahead of time is super important because you are figuring out what a win looks like for that call, right? You're figuring out what the goal is and how you're going to approach it. And that is super important, right? Call, uh, meeting, whenever you have a meeting with a potential donor, I always like to set an agenda too. Sometimes we just go out for coffee and that's fine. We're just meeting and greeting each other, but I want to be respectful of other people's time. So when I sit down, I just say, hey, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, if you have a half hour, I would love to take it. Or, you know, do you have a half hour? Yes or no. Um, great. So in the next 30 minutes, I want to do a couple of things. One, I want to hear about your investment parameters. I want to understand why you invest. I want to understand if... Um, in, if investing with a company that makes an impact is important to you. I want to go over the state of the real estate market and understand why the interest rates aren't going to bother us and how this hedge, hedges against inflation and the state of the market and where are we buying and then finally the investment opportunity at the end and then if you have any questions. Is that cool? Yes, that's great. Now I know exactly where we're going, right? So do they. Um, especially when you're in person, be mindful of nonverbal communications. Right, crossing arms, leaning back, leaning forward. If you can get somebody to lean forward while you're giving them a presentation, you kind of got them, right? Nonverbal cues. Uh, the like switch talks a lot about the nonverbal cues. Watching your tone, being mindful of your tone is super important. Um, when my wife and I first got married, we would be having a conversation and I, this wasn't the right way to go about it, but I would recognize that the tone was getting at hand and I would just say tone. <laughs> and I don't do that anymore, 15 years married. Um, but what it did was it kind of caught the counterpart off guard, right? Grace at this point, and she was like, what do you mean tone? Like your, your tone is not communicating this effectively. So watch your tone, how your, your tonality, um, Chris Voss calls it the late night DJ voice. When you're trying to get somebody to slow down and really hear you, are you um, speaking a little bit quieter in a lower voice, in a lower tenure? because now you guys are actively listening to me, right? Because I'm speaking in a different way. So watch your tonality. It really helps in how you're communicating. And it can, being from the Northeast, some of us, like we have a tendency to go off the rails and get really da -da 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 -da. That kind of sends a communication off the rails. If you can have a good cadence and a good tone to your voice, that really helps with effective communication. Uh, active listening. So this is the Harvard Business Review that's giving us these tips and tricks. So we already talked about active listening. Building emotional intelligence. So <laughs> I am convinced that EQ is more important than IQ. And the only way that you can build your emotional intelligence, unfortunately, is reps under the bar. You need to understand your own feelings. You need to understand where you're getting off the rails, where it's sending you down a rabbit hole versus... Um, what makes you excited? What makes you passionate, right? When I get super passionate about the giving that we do through our donor advice fund, investors feel that and they feel more 
passionate about making an impact in the world too. And that translates. Um, building your emotional intelligence, understanding why you feel the way you feel, and then also how are you controlling that, right? If you're ever in a high stress conversation, like it's really important to take a deep breath, slow down your speech, calm your voice down because you're not going to ramp the conversation up. You'll bring it down and you'll be able to control your emotions a lot better. So you can empathize um, and that's control. That's emotional quotient. You can deliver bad news, but you can still actively listen to a prospective uh, person. You can say hard things, but in a way that doesn't create catastrophe, right? So emotional quotient, emotional intelligence, really important how to develop that. Uh, develop workplace communication strategy. We talked about how we did that before and then create a positive organizational culture. Creating a positive work environment uh, with your counterparts, with your donors, all of that stuff, right? We want to have positive communication because that when you th when somebody thinks of you, you would like them to think of positive communication, right? When you guys interact with Celia, right? Do you ever think back and go, man, what a terrible conversation? No, because she is really good at communication and she gives you this feeling of a positive trustworthy, empathetic dialogue, right? So good job, Seal. She always does that. So hopefully this is helpful for you guys. Um, I'm going to go watch some golf. See you next week. I will be here. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Investing with Purpose podcast. If you're finding value, would you leave us a review and share this with your friends and go to investingwithpurpose.org to learn more about how to partner with us and to learn more about the nonprofits that we support around the world.